Well, good evening, and welcome back to Confirmation here at Bethel Lutheran Church. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, we had to change things up last week, as you all know, and we aren't in person at all these days, uh, thanks to COVID and the rising numbers, but we are able to still meet uh, via Zoom. Uh, thanks to good technology. I know you're all quite used to this at this point in your lives, and it's nothing new. Uh, but I give thanks that we're able to connect in small groups and have we've got a little time here with a large group presentation uh, to take a look at what God is doing through his word. And I want to remind you as we begin that as Lutherans, we teach and trust that God is doing two things always through the word. And the word might seem like a passive thing, but God actually accomplishes things through it. And the two things are law and gospel. So God is always accusing, telling us what we haven't done. We say it sometimes in the confession that uh, I haven't loved my neighbor as myself, and I haven't loved God with all my heart, mind, and soul. This is the summation of the law. God is reminding us of this, but he is also giving to us new life forgiveness of our sin, uh, and this is what we call the gospel. So God is doing this even as we gather here tonight. Imagine that. Even though we're remotely gathered, as we hear the word, God is doing something to you, probably two things. And so tonight we're taking a look at chapter 11, from shepherd to king. And uh, we are hearing from uh, about the story of David, who was the greatest king in the history of Israel, of course, until Jesus who was a king of a whole different kind, uh, but he had humble beginnings. And that's what this chapter focuses on. We have a couple chapters revolving around David uh, because he's that important in the Old Testament. But I wanted to uh, start with the video. The video will have a little review for us, and then we'll jump into uh, a couple of snippets from the reading. And that's about all we'll have time for. So let me start with the video here. I'm working with software that I'm not used to. There we go. And boom. There was a woman named Hannah. Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Samuel. One night, God spoke to him in his room, telling him about things that would happen in Israel in the future. God would use Samuel to speak to the Israelites over and over as a prophet. But the Israelites weren't satisfied with the prophet. Despite Samuel's warning against it, they demanded God give them a king. God told Samuel who to make king, a man named Saul. When the Israelites saw him, they shouted, Long live the king! The Philistines gathered a huge army. Some of the Israelites ran away in fear. But Samuel gave instructions to Saul that would lead to their victory. Saul grew impatient, and before Samuel got there, he offered the sacrifice himself. Saul's actions had terrible consequences. It was time for another king. One day, God told the prophet Samuel that it was time for a new king and sent him to the house of a man named Jesse. Jesse had seven sons and brought out each of them to meet Samuel. Samuel told Jesse that David, his youngest son, would be the future king of Israel. Shortly after this, an army of the Philistines, Israel's enemy, set up camp on a hill right across the valley from Israel's army. For 40 days in a row, a gigantic Philistine warrior named Goliath would walk down to the valley and mock the Israelites. But one day when David was visiting the army camp, he heard Goliath taunting the Israelites and asked why no one was willing to fight Goliath. After getting King Saul's permission, David went down into the valley and shouted to Goliath, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Goliath and David charged toward one another. David pulled out a stone, put it in a sling, and flung it at the giant. The stone struck Goliath directly in the forehead, and then David killed him with Goliath's own sword. 
This victory caused David to become so loved and respected that King Saul became very jealous. Saul tried to kill David, but David escaped into the desert. One day, Saul was in a cave and David snuck up on him. But David could not bring himself to kill Saul. When Saul realized what had happened, he made a peace treaty with David, promising he would not kill him. But not long after, Saul became jealous and tried to kill David again. The Philistines attacked the Israelites and killed all three of Saul's sons. When Saul heard the news, he was so upset that he took out his own sword, fell on it, and killed himself. Then, David was named King of Israel. He made plans to build a giant building called a temple as a place to worship God. God said a temple would eventually be built, but by one of David's sons. One of David's descendants would become a king unlike any before, one whose rule would never end. All right, so we just got a quick history uh, review of the last chapter, which was about King Saul, and then into King David. I want to give uh, just a little uh, heads up to that history. Did God want the Israelites to have a king? Question number one. Did God want the Israelites to have a king? No, he did not. He warned them, in fact, saying, I am your king. Whenever you have a human king, it's not going to go well for you. You know what kings do? They bring you into war, and they make your uh, sons and daughters slaves. Uh, and did this happen well in a matter of course? Yes, this is what kings often do. Uh, and Saul did this. Saul was chosen by God, but he did not turn out to be a great king in the end. Uh, and he was vexed by a lack of faith. And so he never knew who was on his side. So then David comes up, also chosen by God, interestingly, and we'll, we'll go over that with a little more detail, that part of the story. Uh, and Saul gets jealous. Let me ask you, when you're always looking over your shoulder, worried about the next person coming up, I don't know how many of you are run track or play sports, but when you're running, <laughs> you, there's always someone faster. Uh, at least for most of us, this is true. Uh, maybe for one of us, this isn't. But otherwise, there's always someone that's coming up that's a little faster or a little better. Uh, no matter how good or fast we are, uh, we find this to be the case. So it was with Saul. And so he's looking over his shoulder. And David is chosen to be king, but he does not become king right away. And Saul gets really worried about this one who has the heart of the people. And he tries to kill David. Uh, his Saul that was not trusting God in his word to be his worth, but he was trusting his popularity, his sense of self to be his worth. And this is always a big trap for us. Uh, even in the days of uh, positive self-talk, we say sometimes, or uh, positive self-image, these are important, of course, uh, but they cannot replace how God describes us. They cannot replace the fact that we go to God's word to find our true value. Saul did not have this reminder. He did not have a preacher, unfortunately. And so he ended up living in fear of David, which was also in fear of his own failure. But David comes up, and I wanted also to touch base with a little bit of that history. Uh, you remember a couple of weeks ago, we heard about uh, Ruth. A few weeks before that, we heard about uh, Rahab, the prostitute. Joshua brought the spies in. Rahab uh, protected them in Jericho and uh, hid them. And uh, when Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, the walls came tumbling down. You remember that? Rahab and her family were the only ones spared. Everyone else was killed. Well, Rahab had a son. His name was Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. You might remember we just touched on this in the large group a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Ruth and Boaz got married, and they had a son named Obed. And he had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named David. So these women in the story, who generally in a patriarchal society, which is uh, dominated by men and fathers, don't have a voice, here they are named 
and have an important place. And they weren't even Jewish. They were Gentiles. Uh, but they have a place in the story to David and eventually to Christ. I wanted to start with that. Uh, and we got the overview. I'm going to read a little bit from our story, the first page and a half or so, and see where that takes us. It's always is a disaster, the editorial notes tell us at the beginning of page, what page are we on? Uh, 145. He's reckless. He refuses to listen to God or the prophet Samuel. So God tells Samuel to prepare a new king for Israel. David, a teenage shepherd from Bethlehem. David turns out to be a top-notch warrior. As David's star rises, Saul becomes more paranoid. Two men are on a collision course. Only one can sit on Israel's throne. All right, so that's the synopsis. And now we jump into the scripture. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him over king, as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Oh, which son, we might wonder. Which son will be king? Certainly the largest, the most handsome, the most muscular, the tallest. That's what we might think, but we would be mistaken. I'll keep reading. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? This apparently, by the way, uh, Jesse had assembled all the sons except for David, who was the youngest, smallest, was still outside, wasn't even considered by his father. And Jesse said, there is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. Can't imagine you want him. But Samuel said, send for him, and we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health, had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. David was chosen, not because of his appearance, not because of what uh, his, his might, but because of his heart. And what does this mean now in Scripture? What does the heart mean to God? Well, his faith, his, sorry, my... Goodness. Sorry, my computer just locked up getting an email. I think it's it's uh, at its limit. My poor computer, don't judge it by its appearance, please. Uh, it's doing the best it can. Uh, but uh, what is a heart? What is the value of a heart in Scripture in the Old Testament? It is faith. To hear God's word and trust it above all other things. That's our first snippet. We don't have much more time, uh, so I'm going to trust you to go through the rest of the story, but I'm going to go right to the very end of this chapter, chapter 11, back to page uh, 160. Well, I'm going to start on the bottom of 159. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you when your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who, who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. 
I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. This is what the Lord said to David. Now, David had wanted to build for God a new house, really the temple. Uh, up to this point, they still just had a tent for God and the Ark of the Covenant. But David wanted to build a temple, and this was God's response. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you, and not just a house to live in, uh, but he will be the one I will establish his throne forever. He will be one of your sons. My kingdom will be established forever. Who is this? Well, of course, it, it points to, not to Solomon, who will be the next king, uh, though we're not through with David. He's got troubles of his own coming up in the next chapter. But if we go way forward another thousand years from David, we get to Jesus. Sorry, my computer, another email popped up. We get another thousand years, we get to Jesus Christ. And there, the kingdom of God is established forever. And not just for David now, but for you, you who are here, listening, participating in confirmation, you are part of this kingdom. You have a king, I suppose, in a small way in David, but in a very large way in Jesus Christ. I'm going to leave you with that and close us in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have established your kingdom. Open our ears and our hearts so that we may enjoy your promise of everlasting life in your kingdom with Christ and probably with David too. Bless our small groups. Bless our confirmation students. Keep them intrigued by your word. Keep them intrigued by their small group. Bless their small group leaders. All of this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Great to be with you tonight. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful week. Happy Thanksgiving.